Hello and God bless you. This is Cassandra Hill from Mount Sinai Deliverance Missionary Baptist Church in Chicago, Illinois, bringing to you today the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, February 27, 2022. And this is lesson number 13 from the Winter Quarter. And our lessons are coming from the Union Gospel Press Christian Life Series books. And I just want to say to everyone who may be watching, God bless you and hello. I hope all is going well with you and with your household. I hope that you have had a blessed week and that you're ready to start off another week uh, in the Lord. And uh, before we go into our Sunday school lesson today, we just want to bow our head in the word of prayer. We always want to ask the Lord to be with us in whatever we endeavor to do for him. So at this time, let us pray. Dear Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to tell you thank you. Thank you, Father God, for another opportunity to study your word. And Father, as we study, we ask that you would open up our understanding and help us to receive what you would have for us to receive today. And then, Lord, we just ask that you would just touch everyone in um, the viewing audience, Lord, whatever need there may be, Father. We just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would touch right now. Lord, the, the bereaved today, Father, we ask that you would encourage their hearts and give them comfort, Lord, as they um, go through this time of their lives. And then, Father, those that may be sick, Father, we ask that you would just allow your healing virtue to flow right to the point of that need, Lord. We know that you are able to do anything, and we ask that you would just heal right now in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, we just ask that you would look on those that may be in a financial need today father we know that the earth is the lord's the fullness thereof and the world and they that dwell therein for so we just ask right now that you would open up a, a door for those that are in need today lord whatever the situation may be and lord we just pray for the events taking place all over the world today lord we know that there's uh, there's so much going on, so much turmoil. And, and Father, we just ask that you have mercy on your people today, Father. Even those that may not even know you, we ask for mercy today, Lord. We just know that you're able, you're able to do anything and you are a merciful God. So we just ask right now that you just look and have mercy, Lord, on those that are just in dire straits today, Lord. All over the world, there's, there's so much going on, Father. We just ask that you would touch in Jesus' name, Lord. And, Father, we just thank you for everything that you have done. And we just believe you and we trust you for what you're going to do. And we count it all done. In Jesus' name, we pray and we thank you for it. Amen. Amen. So, once again, we're just so grateful to be able to study the Lord's uh, word today and um, this is the last lesson for this winter quarter and uh, it's also the last of a, a series of lessons that we have been studying which have focused on the events that took place during Jesus' Passion Week and even uh, in last week's lesson um, we studied how uh, Jesus uh, was crucified. We studied John, the Gospel of John, his account of Jesus' crucifixion. And we also looked at some uh, portions of the other Gospels, um, their accounts of the crucifixion. And looking at all of the Gospels combined, we saw that Jesus' crucifixion fulfilled all of the prophecies concerning Messiah's death. So this gives us more confidence that Jesus in fact was the Messiah because all prophecies were fulfilled. And we saw that um, Jesus' final proclamation was one of victory when he stated, it is finished. He then surrendered his life to the Father and he died. But we know that that was not the end for Jesus because we know that in three days he rose again. Now today's lesson shows an event that took place after Jesus' resurrection. And that takes us to today's topic, uh, which is um, the Jesus by the Sea of Tiberias. And the lesson text is coming from John chapter 21 verses 1 through 14. 
Our related scriptures are Luke chapter 5 verses 1 through 11, John chapter 20 verses 19 through 29, and then chapter 21 uh, verses 15 through 25. The time is AD and the plate the time is AD 30, excuse me, and the place is the Sea of Tiberias. Now the golden text reads, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. And this is coming from John chapter 21 and verse number 14. Today's aim is to confirm that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day and appeared to his disciples. To recognize that Jesus' resurrection was physical and guarantees life to all who believe in him. And to know the power of Jesus' resurrection by firmly trusting that he is the giver of life to those who believe in him. And we can see for a reference John chapter 6 verses 25 through 36 and chapter 14 and verse 19. Now we begin our reading with John chapter 21 and verse 1. And it reads, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. Amen. All right. So now last week uh, we were studying from John chapter 19 and today we're studying from John chapter 21. So I just want to quickly mention some of the things that took place in John chapter 20. So first of all, we know that we have the resurrection story. Mary Magdalene, in John's um, got, uh, gospel, he mentions Mary Magdalene, but in the other gospels, other women were also mentioned with Mary Magdalene. And we know that they went to... Um, to take care of the body of Jesus because they didn't have embalming and those type of things that we have today. They didn't do that, um, but they added spices to the body to preserve the body as long as possible. And this is what the women were doing that resurrection morning. Um, but when they got there, um, they found that the stone had been rolled away. So Mary Magdalene runs and she goes to get Peter and John and when they arrive uh, Peter goes into the tomb and he finds it empty except for the grave clothes that Jesus had been buried in. Peter and John then leaves the tomb not sure what had taken place but Mary stays behind and she's there weeping when she looks up and sees two angels and then she turns about and she sees the Lord Jesus. Uh, but she does not initially recognize him. And it's after Jesus calls Mary by her name that she realizes that this is Jesus speaking to her. Jesus tells her to go and tell his disciples that he is going to the Father. Mary obeys and she goes where the disciples are and she tells them. So later that evening, uh, Jesus appears in the room where ten of the disciples had assembled. Thomas was not present. So Jesus spent time there. He's speaking with the disciples and he's showing the disciples the wounds in his body, proving to them that it is he physically that's in the room with them and they're not seeing some type of apparition. Eight days later, after that appearance, Jesus reappears. Um, he appears again. Uh, to the disciples and this time Thomas is present so he gets an opportunity to examine Jesus for himself to see that it truly is in fact Jesus in the flesh um, then John goes on to say at the end of chapter 20 about Jesus uh, let me read that uh, he says uh, this is the end of chapter uh, 20 of John verses 30 and 31 he says and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that believing ye might have life through his name. So John tells us that a lot of miracles took place that were not even recorded at this time. This is after the resurrection. So this is giving more proof that Jesus was there bodily. It was not a spiritual Jesus. It was a natural bodily Jesus. I mean, he had a spiritual body, a glorified body, I should say, because he had ascended to the Father, but it was him it there with them. And um, John, the way he's um, phrasing these verses, it, it sounds like a good closing for the gospel of John, a natural closing of the gospel. But then we go on to see chapter 21. And um, some Bible scholars feel that chapter 21 is sort of an epilogue or an appendix to the gospel of John. But as we go into chapter 21 and into today's lessons, uh, we see that it says after these things. And that refers to all of these events that had taken place in chapter 20 after Jesus' resurrection, his appearance to Mary, uh, his appearance to his disciples twice, and the miracles that um, John mentions at the end of chapter 20 that were performed that were not even recorded. So after all these things, um, we see we start the beginning of verse number 21. Now we're not told how soon after. Uh, we don't know how long of a period of time this was uh, that since Jesus had uh, been resurrected. We don't know. But Jesus had another uh, encounter uh, with his disciples. And this time it was at the Sea of Tiberias. Now our textbook goes on to explain that the Sea of Tiberias, that's another name for the Sea of Galilee. And then the Sea of Galilee also has another name. There's some other names. But this is the Sea of Galilee. This is the area that uh, G many of G most of Jesus' followers, uh, his disciples, I should say, were from uh, Galilee. Um, so it's interesting at Galilee because uh, Jesus made mention of Galilee at the Last Supper. He told his disciples that he would meet them in Galilee after the resurrection. And let me um, take a look at that in Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 32. Um, these are the words of Jesus. He was telling the disciples that uh, he would, that, that, that he would uh, be crucified. Basically, he was saying he, the shepherd would be smitten. So in other words, he's speaking of his death, his crucifixion. But he says in verse number 32, but, but after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Amen. And also, if we look at Matthew's, um, his account of uh, the resurrection in ch chapter number 28 of Matthew, and specifically in verse number 10 of Matthew 28, it says, Then said Jesus unto them, now he's speaking again to those that were at the grave. This, so these were the women. Amen. He's speaking to them and he says, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. So it was expected. They were expecting to see Jesus if they remembered his wording. And evidently they did because this is where they had been gathered. Now, Let's go on to verse number two, and it reads, There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately and that night they caught nothing amen all right so here looking um, at verse number two we see the disciples that were present at this um this particular event um it was seven of them 
we see uh, Simon Peter, that's Peter, we know Peter, and Thomas called Didymus. Now, uh, the text uh, points out something interesting about Thomas and that both the names Thomas and Didymus mean twin. So Thomas was a twin. And um, the Bible scholars believe that uh, his twin is assumed to be either Matthew or James, uh, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, now, uh, these three were brothers, um, uh, uh, Thomas, uh, Matthew, and this particular James. This is not James, the son of Zebedee. This is another James. So uh, that's something interesting to know that, that uh, there were some twins and the, the, the group of the disciples. Uh, also, we mentioned Nathaniel here. Now, Nathaniel is, uh, he's most likely the one that is referred to as Bartholomew in the other Gospels and in the book of Acts. So if you look in the other Gospels and you see the name Bartholomew, it is referring to Nathaniel here in John. And, you know, sometimes people had dip multiple names or they had different um you know, in the, the Greek or or, or or other format of their name. So they, they had multiple names here. Um, but then we talk about the uh, the sons of Zebedee. Now we are familiar with the sons of Zebedee. That's is James and John. And John, the writer of the gospel. And we um, discussed last week how John was a cousin of Jesus. So James and John's they they were cousins of Jesus, and then they have two other disciples that are not named. Now, because these are these disciples were not named, some commentators believe that they were probably not one of the eleven apostles. But that's not necessarily the case. It's just an assumption that's made because they are not mentioned by name. But on this particular day, Peter decides to go fishing, and the other disciples decide to join him. Now, this is not unusual um, since Peter, James, and John, they were all fishermen by trade. So, um, one thing our textbook uh, asks us not to read anything into this, that Peter uh, and the other disciples are fishing that they have um, somehow retreated from their commitment to serve in the Lord because they are fishing. Um, now, you know, a lot of fishermen, that you know, that's what they love to do. They love to fish. So it's not, you shouldn't be seen as that they, you know, are doing something that is against, you know, going against their commitment to Christ here. But also, um, we should see this perhaps as, um, they they were a, a waiting for further instruction from the Lord, and instead of being idle in their waiting, they were doing something to make provisions for their support. Since again, these men are professional fishermen, this is a way of making provisions uh, for their uh, their own support, their own livelihood, as well as to feed themselves. Uh, so. We, uh, we, we, we could uh, assume that being um, uh, professional fishermen, that they, they would know the best time of day to start this fishing expedition. But as we can see from verse number three, uh, even though they fished that night, they caught nothing. Uh, so um, um, we, we, it, they, they put forth their best efforts, I'm sure, as professionals, but they still did not catch anything. So now let's pick up with verse number uh, four. It says, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, children, have ye any meat? They answered him, no. All right, amen, okay. So we see that here in the morning, um, um, the disciples began to make their way back to the shore, having caught nothing. Amen. And as they approached the shore, Jesus was standing there, but they did not recognize him. Um, it could be 
a lot of reasons for that, right? It was early in the morning, and there probably um, wasn't much light out um, in the day yet, being it was so early. And it also could have been some fog or something, a mist uh, at the seashore that inhibited their, um, their view. Um, and, of course, they really wasn't expecting to see anyone, no doubt at that time of the morning uh, especially Jesus amen they, that was probably not you know at their last expectation to see Jesus at that time so um, Jesus speaks to them and he asks them if they have any meat uh, and that, that word meat here uh, can be translated as something to eat so Jesus is asking them if they had anything to eat and they responded back no because of course they had not caught anything okay now verse number six says and he said unto them cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find they cast therefore and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes all right, so we see here that this stranger standing on the seashore gives them a suggestion, right? He gives them some advice. He suggests that they cast their net back into the sea on the right side of the boat, amen, or, or the right side of the ship. He said, if you do that, you shall find. Now, listen, these are professional fishermen. They, 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 by trade, they know what they're doing, amen, they've been out on the water, amen, all night, and they haven't caught anything, and they, and now you see this stranger telling them to put their net back in the water, now they could have, you know, they could have said, look, you, we don't take advice from people we don't know, number one, we're professionals, we know what we're doing, but that was not the attitude that they had, right? Amen. They they didn't do that. They obeyed the stranger. They, I guess they figured they had nothing to lose, so they followed the stranger's advice. But let's look, look at what could have happened if they had not followed that advice or if they had had that, that kind of attitude of not being able to be told anything or, or to be suggesting anything so you know we have to kind of watch that attitude don't we sometimes we as human beings we can have that kind of attitude where we just can't be told anything <laughs> amen but they didn't have that attitude they they obeyed what this stranger had told them and let's read on and see what happened amen uh we saw that uh well, we, we see in this verse that, that they had so many. It says, and now they were not able to draw it uh, for the multitude of fishes. They had so many fish that they couldn't even draw the net back into the boat. See what obedience did for them. Amen. How it blessed them. Amen. And reminds me of that scripture that says what obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. It's so important, amen, as long as you know that you're being obedient to the right, right one, amen. So, now this miracle here of them drawing in so many fish is almost identical to the miracle that Jesus performed near the beginning of their discipleship when Jesus called them. Now, that's recorded back in Luke chapter 5, verses uh, one through six. Now you can go back and read that. How when Peter, James, and John uh, were were there, and they had fished all night, and they had caught nothing. And um, similar to this time, Jesus told the fishermen to cast their nets again, and again they obeyed Jesus. That's the good thing about them. They had an obedient spirit, right? Because they obeyed that first time. They obeyed the second time as well. And their nets, that, that back in Luke, their nets were so filled that the net that time, it broke. Amen, amen. So this event here at the Sea of Tiberias, amen, the Sea of Galilee, 
it would have definitely brought back to mind that earlier miracle. You know, we we, we sing some songs, and you know, things, uh, uh, we sing a song, I'm trying to say, amen, I never shall forget what he done for me. Amen. I'm sure the disciples would never forget that miracle when Jesus called them. Amen. So that brought back to memory. Amen. This event that's taking place now on the Sea of Tiberias is brought back to memory that first miracle experience they had uh, when Jesus called them and the, their, the, their nets had broken. Amen. Amen for the amount of fish that they had. Okay, we're going to go on with verse number 7. It reads, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fishers coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land. But as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. I'm going to read here um, a little bit of our text. Amen. Because it, it talks about these two verses. It says, at this point, the disciple whom Jesus loved, presumably John, identified the figure on the shore. Since it was none other than the Lord Jesus himself, John declared, it is the Lord. Peter immediately put on his outer tunic. Naked, likely indicates he was clothed only in the undergarments suitable to his trade. Amen. So they, they're pointing out that he probably wasn't physically naked, but he was just stripped down to the undergarments that would be suitable um, to fish in. Amen. Um, and we could understand that he wouldn't want to get his clothing wet like that. So J Peter, he jumped into the sea and swam to the shore. He was so excited. Amen. That this was the Lord that he didn't wait to get in the boat and ride over with everybody else. He jumped in the water and he swam to the shore. He was excited. He was in a hurry to see the Lord. The other disciples followed in the boat, still dragging the net, teeming with a heavy load of fish. Peter kind of like he kind of forgot about the fish at that point. He was more focused on seeing Jesus. Since they were 200 cubits about 100 yards from shore when Peter jumped out, we can again understand why they had been unable to recognize Jesus by sight. But the miracle of the fish left no doubt about his identity. Amen. Again, that miracle brought back to mind that first miracle that was similar to this one. Amen. And they knew for a sure that was nobody but Jesus, amen, they could do those things, amen, okay, we're going to pick up a verse number 9, and it reads, as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread, Jesus saith unto them, bring of the fish which ye have now caught, Amen and amen. All right. So um, when the uh, disciples reached the shore, they found a meal, amen, of fish and bread that had been prepared by the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, some Bible scholars said that this was a miracle, while others don't go so far. You know, it was a miracle that Jesus had uh, produced this fish and that and this bread and and the coals and the fire he had produced all of this amen but some people uh, some commentators say well it could have been this it could have been other reasons why we got that but one thing for sure we know that jesus is a miracle worker so it's not beyond his ability to do so 
And we have seen in the scriptures where Jesus had miraculously fed thousands. So for him to feed just these seven men, that wouldn't have been a big uh, issue for Jesus at all. And um, I was also thinking about how in the Old Testament, how God provided food for his people while they were in the desert, all of those people. And even how the Lord provided for the prophet Elijah. He let the ravens bring food to Elijah during a time of famine. So um, the point here that I'm making is that the Lord, uh, he is showing his disciples that he will provide for their needs. As we have seen, like I gave those examples, even in the Old Testament, the Lord will provide for the needs of his people. And this should give us comfort today as well, that as we continue to stay faithful to the Lord and to stay committed to his service, he will take care of us, uh, no matter what the circumstances look like. Um, the Lord, he, he then, he tells his disciples uh, in verse number 10, to bring some of the fish that they had caught to add to the meal. Amen. So they would have enough and more than enough. Amen. And this, uh, these fish that they are bringing, we know that they were caught by the miraculous power of Jesus. So whether you want to say it was the, the, the fish that were on the shore uh, that Jesus had there on the grill, whether that was part of a miracle, all of it, is, we know that it is God, Jesus has miracle working power. And that's the main thing is that he will provide for his people. We don't have to worry about that. Now we pick up with verse number 11, which reads, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes and 150 and three. And for all, there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Amen. Okay, so in obeying Jesus' request that they uh, bring some of the fish that they had caught, um, Simon pulled, uh, Simon Peter, he pulled the net full of fish to the shore. And as uh, he did so, he, he took count, evidently, he took count of the number of fish and saw that there were 153 large fish in the net and miraculously the heavy load of fish uh, that they had caught it caused no fraying or any tearing of the net so again that was a miracle in itself that the net didn't break with that many fish in it amen so the text book kind of deals with the number 153 because that you know some people was well is there any significance to it the text says that whether there is any particular significance to the number of fish caught is mere speculation. True, some biblical numbers are notable, but others are included merely to serve in relating concrete facts about an actual historical event. So we can speculate, and some have speculated that the 153 has a particular meaning. But the the but what we can uh, say for sure is that it was 153, and that was the actual historical fact concerning this event. And another thing we can say is that the number of fish, uh, 153, would be uh, much more than they could eat in one setting. So um, who knows? Perhaps they could sell the leftovers and thus provide for their future needs because if they if the purpose for them going fishing in the first place was to provide for their um, their needs um, then uh, this would certainly help if for them to sell the fish since again these were professional uh, fishermen by trade they could certainly sell the fish and have uh, uh, finances for whatever their next venture would be or what or however long it would be that they would be there in Galilee all right okay now verse number 12 it reads Jesus saith unto them come and dine 
And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Okay, amen. So we see here that Jesus invites them to come and eat. Amen. Now verse number 12, it says that Jesus said uh, unto them, come and eat. Come and die, and none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? It, it, this seems to indicate that the disciples did not recognize Jesus by his appearance. And perhaps there was something about his appearance in his glorified body that was different from before um, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Now, we see um, similar uh, instances of this recorded in um, Luke um, chapter 24 and verses uh, 13 through uh, 35 when Jesus walked along with his disciples, uh, well, with some of the disciples, he walked along with them and talked with them on Emmaus Road. But they did not realize that it was Jesus until after Jesus was gone, had gone out of their midst. Amen. And the Bible doesn't really tell us why Jesus' disciples did not always recognize Jesus after his resurrection. Because remember, when we started our lesson, we were talking about Mary Magdalene. And when she encountered Jesus at the tomb, she didn't recognize him either. Amen. So the Bible is not really specific as to why. We don't know if it was something physically um, difference of, different about his appearance or if, if, if there was some supernatural means by which Jesus caused them not to initially recognize them. Um, we don't know. Um, 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 and we can only speculate. I, I, I saw one reading where it was saying that perhaps Jesus did not want them focused on his person as he was speaking to them after his resurrection because um, they would pay more attention instead of just blindly accepting what Jesus is saying they would actually listen to the person that's speaking that 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 because that physically they looked a little different um, well we don't know but you know it reminds me of uh, when Jesus explained why he taught in parables back in Matthew chapter 13 um, he was asked, he was asked, why did he teach in parables? Uh, because many could not understand Jesus' words. Amen. But uh, those that had a true desire, amen, to receive from him, they did receive. They received uh, the gift of spiritual uh, discernment. And they were able to see and hear and understand what Jesus was saying while and while there were so many others that were well educated but they could not grasp Jesus uh, uh, his, his teachings because they did not have that discernment amen so maybe it's something similar going on here maybe um, this is a way for those that Jesus would be around they wouldn't even recognize him but his disciples they they would recognize him they it eventually the, their discernment would kick in and they would recognize who this was they were speaking to and by the things that he was the miracles he was performing the words he was speaking they knew that had to be Jesus um, so um, we know that that these it was recorded that these people actually saw Jesus in the flesh everybody didn't see him but these people did see them amen but one day revelation 1 and 7 tells us that one day we all will see jesus amen amen let me flip over that real quick and to reach revelation 1 and 7 says behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth 
shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So one day every eye shall see him. Amen. And, and those that had doubt will have no more doubt. Amen. Because they will see him for themselves. Amen. However, um, coming back to our lesson today here in verse 12, none of them asked um, who he was because they knew. Amen. They didn't ask, they wasn't out of fear from asking. We're afraid to ask him. Amen. It was because they knew that for sure that this was Jesus. They didn't have any need to ask. They knew who he was. Amen. They had witnessed this uh, miraculous catch of fish that took their minds back to the day when Jesus called them. Amen. And now Jesus was taking the bread and the fish and giving it to his disciples. And this surely reminded them of the Last Supper that they had shared with Jesus when he passed out the food to them. Amen. So this this is this was this clear this this showed evidently clear to them who he was. They knew who Jesus was. Amen. Now I'm reading here from our text. It says it is significant that Jesus devoted his post resurrection appearances to simply spending time with his disciples doing ordinary daily things such as eating a meal or walking down a road. We might be reminded of John 13 and 1, which reads, When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Amen. Again, now Jesus is um, he's, he, at this point, he is going to return to the Father. Amen. And he's going to be with them for an extent, for a long time. Amen. He's going to be out, out of the earth realm for a long time. Amen. He's going to the Father. Amen. But he's coming back again. Amen. As we read in Revelation 1 and 7. But this time that he has left in the, in the world, in his resurrected body, Jesus is spending with the ones he loves. Amen. And our text goes on to read that Jesus loves to spend time with his disciples. So it should be, excuse me, so it should likewise be our heart's desire to spend frequent quality time with him as well. Amen. Jesus loves to spend time with his disciples. He loves to spend time with us as well even us today we ought to spend time in the word of god we ought to spend time in prayer amen we ought to spend time acknowledging god and the bible says that in all of your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path amen so with this ought to be something that we do because we love jesus just as jesus loved his disciples and he wanted to spend time with them we ought to love him and want to spend time with him just likewise amen amen and we have to come against anything in our lives that want to keep us from spending time with the lord jesus spending time again in his word and spending time in prayer spending time in worship amen we see people have such low tolerance for that we want to hurry up and get in church and hurry up and get out of church amen but we don't mind spending hours amen watching tv and reading other books and other things but we ought to want to spend time with the one who loves us so much amen all right um so um now verse number 14 it says this is now the third time that jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead so this was jesus's third appearance after his resurrection amen and um our text goes on to clarify that for us it says john may simply uh be saying that this appearance at the sea of tiberius was merely the third one he was recording in his gospel or that this was the third time the risen Jesus appeared to a group of disciples where he personally was a part. So um, the 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 the, um, the um, textbook here is 
clarifying what John might have meant by saying that this was the third time, amen, that Jesus appeared after his resurrection. It maybe was the third time that he's record in his recordings or the third time at which he was present that he could testify to. Um, the textbook goes on to say there were many other things Jesus did that John does not record in his gospel as he freely affirms in its final verse. And let me read that final verse of the gospel of John. It says, this is John 21 and verse number 25. It says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. All right, so John was letting us know that he didn't uh, record everything. There were so many other things that he just couldn't record. But he gave us enough, amen, because if we look back in verse, uh, in chapter 20, one of these, uh, one of the things that he, uh, he said in that, those last verses, he said, um, but these are, this is the last verse of chapter 20. So this is John 20 and verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. He gives us his purpose for his writing. The things that John recorded is, is for us to believe. Amen and amen. All right. Now, that is the end of uh, our, our verses for today's lesson. So let me read our conclusion. It says that we will never run out of strength. If we will rely on God's strength, we will never fail if we obey what God says. Doing God's will is a guarantee of success in God's eyes. As we close this quarter, please take a moment and thank the Lord for dying for your sins and rising from the dead. Amen. And Lord, we do thank you. We thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and for rising from the dead. Amen. With all power in your hand, Lord, we thank you for it right now. Amen and amen. Okay, now let us go to our practical points. And practical point number one says, The Lord shows himself today in a myriad of different ways. And this is coming from John chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. Number two says, sometimes we are so preoccupied that we do not notice the Lord standing right in front of us. This is coming from verses three and four. Number three says, we can confidently do what Jesus says because of who he is. And this is from verses five and six. Number four, we ought to leap at any opportunity to spend time with Jesus. This is from verses 7 through 9. And then number 5, the Lord's abundant provision points us to his bountiful grace. Coming from verses 10 through 13. And finally, number 6 says, there is not mistaking the true testimony that Jesus rose from the dead. And this comes from verses, verse number 14. And then we have questions here for research and discussion that we can take a look at that will, I'm sure, give us a deeper insight into today's lesson. We should surely do that. And then we have next week's lesson, which is the start of a new quarter. Uh, it is entitled Divisions in Corinth. And the lesson text is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 1 through 16. Our related scriptures come from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31 through 33, and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 31. I hope that we have enjoyed today's lesson and this entire quarter. Amen. What a blessing. I just want to read quickly um, at a little uh, section here called Anticipating the Next Lesson. It says, next quarter, 
we will study Paul's instructions to the Corinthian church to prepare us to live as churches built on the firm foundation of Christ. Hey Amen. That should be a great lesson. I'm a great uh, quarter um, that we are going to venture into. I'm telling you something to look forward to. Um, and as I look forward here, we're going to be this whole quarter. Uh, next quarter is going to be covering uh, first and second Corinthians. So that's something certainly to look forward to. We're going to learn about the first and second Corinthians. Amen. Um, I hope that if anyone is watching this video that has not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I hope and pray that you will do that today. Amen. As we read here earlier from the book of John, the reason that he wrote this book was that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And now everybody talks about that when this life is over, they would desire to go to heaven. Amen. They would desire to see Jesus. Well, there's a way you can do that, and the word of God makes it so clear. God has provided a plan of salvation for mankind. And that is through the sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus. That we read about just, um, just now. We, we were studying, and last Sunday we studied the crucifixion. Today we talked about his resurrection and events that took place after the resurrection. I pray that if you feel the tugging of the Holy Spirit on your heart uh, moving you to Christ uh, uh, pulling you that and, and and telling you that you this is something you should do you should accept the Lord Jesus Christ or even if you have accepted Jesus and you strayed away and you feel the tug of the Holy Spirit telling you it's time to come back I pray that you will do that today now at the end of this video is a scripture from Romans 10 that explains that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And I always explain that when you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that means that you are repenting of your sin, of the way that you have lived, and you are confessing that Jesus is Lord over your life, and that you are committing your life to follow the teachings and the instruction that God has left for us in his word. And, you know, the Bible tells us that um, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but shall have everlasting life. Now, if you would desire to do that today, you can do that today. There's a prayer at the end of this video as well that you can use it. If not that prayer, but it has the sentiment of the wording, amen, of confessing your sins and, and, and confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord with your mouth. Believing in your heart. That's the main thing. You have to believe in your heart that this is true. And if you do that, the Bible declares that you have been born again. Now, the next very important step for you to do after that is to find a church that you can um, attend, that you can go, you can be instructed in the word of God. Your pastor will take you to the next steps, water baptism and, and baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is also so important and necessary to live in this world today. Amen. So uh, I pray that you will do that. I pray that you will find a good church that you can be a part of. Amen. And you can receive instruction and teaching. The Bible tells us that we can't hear without a preacher. Amen. And he can't or she can't preach except they be sent. Amen. But it's important to have a pastor. Amen. I know a lot of people say, well, I can just do it myself. No, that's not what the Bible says. Amen. Amen. So let us do it God's way. If we do it God's way, then we'll be blessed. Amen. All right. So I pray that everyone has seen the subject for next week's lesson. We are starting a new quarter. Amen. The spring quarter. God is so good. 
He's brought us through January and February of this year, and we're about to start a new month and a new quarter. So meet me next time for Sunday School so we can get into this uh, new quarter and we can study the book of Corinthians and we can receive from the Lord what he would have for us to receive from his word. Until then, I pray that you will have a blessed week and God continue to bless you.